You hiding freaking Van Gogh's in a coal mine? That's disrespectful. And Rose would be like, I'm going to memorize this. I'm memorizing all of it. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm Tiffany Haddish, and today we're going to talk about Rose Valand. She ready. So it's France. October 1940. Rose Valand's assistant curator at the Jeune de Pomme Museum. So she's like, you know what I know? Art. Then all of a sudden, there, boom, Nazis everywhere. They took over the museum, like, this our spot. This where we going to be at. Ah, right? It's like, oh, shoot, it's Germans everywhere. And what they doing is robbing the French Jews. And now they storing all this stolen art up in there. And you know why? You know why? Hmm. Do you know why? Let me tell you why. Because Hitler was like a proclaimed artist. And he tried to get into this school. He was denied because he couldn't stay in the lines. Uh-uh. He told his boys, y'all go out there and y'all get all the artwork. Now, if it's German art, it's good. But if it ain't German art, burn that shit up. Because Hitler was mad because he didn't get to get into the university. Because you mad you didn't get to get into school. My pussy wet. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but Rose is like the dopest spot. They up there talking. They didn't know she spoke German. She liked it. Mm. Taking notes, taking notes, taking notes, okay? So uh, different people that worked under Hitler would show up to the museum often. Like his main man, his name was Hermann Goring, right? Now, Hermann, you know, he's so ratchet. He be like, give me, that's the best. Run me that. Run me that right there. Ooh, that's nice. Hey, 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 give me something to drink. Bring me some champagne up in here while I'm in here picking the best art. And Rose will be like, I don't know why these are here. He's so lazy. Why you even want to tell me where you stole it from? Do you know who I am? I'm going to tell everybody. She go get the wine, and Herman be like, oh, this uh, money fix. This is a. Uh, I know, I know. He was German. He'd be like, ha, I still it was delicious. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Wait, hold up. I'm toasted. I'm sorry. How you feel? I feel fantastic. <laughs> Anyways, they would load these pieces of art up on a train. The Nazis was putting a lot of stuff down in these deep, dark caves. You hiding stuff in caves? You hiding freaking. Van Gogh's in a coal mine? That's disrespectful. And Rose would be like, I'm going to memorize this. I'm memorizing all of it. Sounding ghetto as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know I was Jewish? I didn't until tonight. Because my father's Jewish, but my mom was a Jehovah Witness, so I'm a Jujo. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... It's December 1944. James Roymer shows up trying to holler at Rose. Rose, I know you know everything. I need you to give me all the information that you have. Where are all the treasures? She's like, I don't know you like that. Who is you? He's like, I'm James Roymer. I'm with the Monuments Men. Now, these was a collection of men and women who went out to save the existence of their culture. Rose, she was dope. She was like, boom, I got these addresses right here. Ch check this out. They would stop trains. They would go to salt mines. They was knocking, knocking people out. Some people died, some people lived. But the art was saved. She saved like over 60,000 pieces of, of culture. She's a heroine. And then finally, Rose is like, go to Herman Goring's house. Send him over there. Boom. $200 million worth of treasures, culture, art. She hooked that up. And Herman Goring was pissed as hell at her. Like, I can't believe she snitched on me. And when she was bringing me all these glasses of champagne. And then Rose does the nay nay. Hey. <laughs> 
But he couldn't do nothing about it, because now he a prisoner of war. And Hitler killed himself, they say. I think he hanging out with Tupac. <laughs> Hello. Today we're going to talk about Wadey Zwering. Wadey Zwering was an eighth generation Charleston guy. He was a judge. This was this guy's life. I'm in Charleston. I love it. I make money. I have my beautiful wife. We're rich people. Look at all our rich friends. But he lived in this place where segregation was the way that it was. I mean, we're fine with each other, but black people go over there, right? That makes sense. He and his wife started playing bridge with this couple, the Hoffmans, Elizabeth Hoffman. She was from Detroit. She was incredibly smart and she was the life of the party. He's never known a woman like this before in his entire life. And he's like, what are you about? There's this thing that starts happening where they're just flirting between bridge hands. Like, Elizabeth, it's your hand. You know what I mean? Oh, ladies, you're so funny. He realized he was in love with Elizabeth and he, he confronted his wife, Annie, and he was like, hey, remember Elizabeth? I'm sleeping with Elizabeth. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting like uh, drunk now. So he married Elizabeth and they were ostracized from Charleston society. You're not Charleston anymore. You're a Yankee. You're an ass. No one likes you. And all they have left is each other. And so Elizabeth starts going to Wadey's court cases. She starts going, oh, shit. maybe all these cases where the white people won, some of the black people got screwed over, you know? And Wadey's was like, mm, yeah, but that's the way it's all, it always has been. And she was like, yeah, but, but black people are people though. And he was like, yeah, black people are people, but like in like a different way. And she said, that's gross. We're going to get dinner with some black people. And he said, white people don't get dinner with black people. And she was like, no, but we do. We're those kind of white people. And he was like, all right, I love you, but I'm telling you right now, it's really not normal for white dinner, white people to get dinner with black people. I feel like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like I, I know. want to throw up. If you want to go throw up, you can. We're very open-minded here. Do you want to just some get some fresh air, air and take a little walk? Yeah, sure. Okay. Just a little bit, and then we'll walk back up. Sure. Does that sound good? So she made her husband get dinner with a black couple, and it was awkward as hell. Just like, hey, what'd you do today? And they were like, I don't know. Several people threatened my life, and they were like, oh, that's interesting. But then Elizabeth made Wadey's keep doing it. After the second time and the third time, it became more regular. And it was like, oh, right, we're all people, you know? He started to understand that black people were incredibly subjugated. Maybe we need to do something about this segregation thing, you know? This is a really good area. I moved here because the last place I lived, my friend got stabbed while he was getting a hand job. No. Yeah, that happened. Did he I don't know, I didn't ask. First thing he did was he integrated his courtroom. And he was like, no, 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 everybody sits together. Black person there, white person there, then black person there, then white person there. Be friends. Quit being ass Just be friends. Then he ruled that black teachers have to be paid the same as white teachers, which is uh, crazy. The next really big one. He ruled black people are now allowed to vote in primaries. And that just like set Charleston on fire. Someone threw a brick through their window one night. The KKK burned a cross on their lawn. It got so bad, there was a petition that 21,000 people signed that said, hey, Warings, here's $10,000. Take this and move anywhere. They're like, no, we still have work to do here, you know? F you. And then Briggs versus Elliot happened. And Thurgood Marshall trying to prove black kids are not getting the same education as white kids. And there were three judges. One of them was Wadey's wearing. The other two were like, yeah, segregation is great. Everything about this is amazing. So who cares if they're equal? So they lost and schools were not integrated in the South. Wadey's is like, well, I'm not going down without a fight. And he writes this 20 page dissent 
Basically what he said was, everyone in Charleston is an ass. You cannot be okay with the fact that black people are separate from white people. This is a nice town. I grew up here my entire life. Why do we punish half our citizens? Stop punishing them. Just be nice. Hashtag be nice, you know? And that was it. And they moved to New York. Man, can I just tell you guys how happy I am to not be as throw up -y as I was like 45 minutes ago? <laughs> that sucked so bad. <laughs> it wasn't until 1954. He seriously changed all of history. When the Supreme Court made their decision in a case called Brown versus Board of Education, they were like, dude, because one lonely judge in Charleston, South Carolina says that black kids are not getting the same education as white kids. And he's proving it. The entire country should be integrated. They based their entire decision on the fact that Wadey said segregation sucks. That dude ate it for years because he believed that black people were the same as white people and that he was in love with his wife. And I think that's really incredible. You seem a million times better than you did. Yeah, well, I threw up <laughs> in the <laughs> toilet, so that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I literally just drooled on the floor. Hello. My name is Paget Brewster, and today we're going to talk about Eleanor Roosevelt and the communist sniper. Cheers. Nostrovia. Nostrovia. Oh, spit. OK. Our story begins in 1941. It was the Second World War, and the US was fighting Japan. And Russia was fighting the Nazis. And Russia is suffering. So Joseph Stalin calls Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and he's like, FDR, my friend, can you help me out here, please? I'm getting my ass kicked here in Russia by these Nazis, because- Nazis. Not Nancys. I didn't say Nancys, I, oh, I said Nazis. Said, Nazis, yeah, yeah, I misheard you. And Franklin's like, it's not up to me, man. I understand what you're talking about. It's a shit show, but I got Congress. I got the American people. I can't help you out right now because no one supports me. So Stalin's like, ah, oh, Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm gonna send someone over there. Pavlichenko, huge sniper, big deal. Highly feared, the greatest sharpshooter in the history of mankind. Just meet with my sniper. So in July of 1942, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his wife Eleanor are like, oh, what's happening today in the White House? We always have stuff to do. And Franklin says, oh, Eleanor, we got to meet with this sniper. This is being sent from the Red Army. And the sniper is a 25-year-old woman named Ludmila Pavlichenko. Say it again. Lyudmila Pavlichenko. Lyudmila. Pavlichenko. 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 I really like you. We're friends. <laughs> what? I'm just letting you finish as a gentleman. You are a gentleman, but with just the right amount of a bastard. <laughs> 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 Shit. Oh, no, I'm drunk. So she says to them, there is no color line. There is no male-female segregation in the Red Army. We are a nation of people who want to defend our motherland. And Eleanor, who is a feminist and a human rights advocate, fucking badass takes Franklin aside and says, this girl, this tomboy, sharpshooting, genius killer, I can take her on the road and she will get us enough American support to go after the Nazis. President Franklin Roosevelt is like, okay, if you think that can happen, go for it. So they get on a train and they're traveling across the US and the American press starts hearing about it girl sniper sent from Russia. She does town hall meetings. She meets with the local press. But all they want to know is, why don't you wear blush 
Are you allowed to wear makeup on the front lines? And then a journalist tells her your uniform, the skirt's too long, it's drab, you look fat. And she's like, what the f are they, f I'm crawling through the mud with a, coyotes! The coyotes eating the neighbor's cat. Well, we gotta wait this out, right? So, so, it's not funny, it's a serious thing. They finally get to Chicago halfway through their journey and backstage, Eleanor Roosevelt is Burgess Meredith from Rocky. She's just massaging her shoulders and saying, come on, you can do this. I know they're asking stupid questions, they're silly questions, don't worry about it, you can make it through. I need you to talk to the American public the way you've talked to me and shame America into joining the second front. So Ludmilla walks out on a Chicago stage and says, gentlemen, I am but 25 years old and I have killed 309 fascist occupants in my country. This uniform I wear that you say is ugly, that you say makes me look fat, this uniform has dirt on it and the blood of my enemies on it and I wear it with pride. Don't you think you've been hiding behind my back for too long? And the crowd goes batshit, bananas, clapping, and Eleanor, she's backstage like, yeah, look, Mila, I love it, go, girl. Oh, Jesus, I got a burp. My stomach's making noise. I'm trying to talk about World War II. It's too much. Okay, so Eleanor Roosevelt and Ludmilla Pavlichenko are going from town to town, and she's no longer a curiosity or an oddity. She's like this impressive folk hero. She's an amazing woman who was so young doing the work of dozens of men at 25 years old. When I was 25, I think I plucked off all my eyebrows and dressed like Prince. Anyway, 15 years later, we are in a cold war with Russia. Eleanor is in Moscow and has a political minder that says, you can't really talk to anyone about anything. You're gonna eat some sable fish. You're gonna drink some vodka. You're gonna wear a furry hat showing that it's not that bad between Russia and America. That's your job, lady. And she's like, ah, no. I'm Eleanor goddamn Roosevelt and I'm gonna go and see my fucking pal. This emissary takes Eleanor Roosevelt to Ludmilla Pavlichenko's house. This woman who was a national hero, but she's living in this tiny two-room apartment, and Ludmilla opens the door. Hello, Ludmilla. Hello, Mrs. Roosevelt. Like, Eleanor and Ludmilla are sitting formally with the Russian minder, and it at a certain point, Ludmilla makes an excuse and says, oh, 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 sorry, sorry, have to leave, and finds a way to take Eleanor away from the Russian minder. And she's half laughing and half crying, and she's hugging Eleanor and saying, oh, my friend, it's so good to see you after all these years. <laughs> and think about all the friends we met on our trip across the U.S. And Eleanor is so happy to talk to her, just saying, oh, Ludmilla, we did have a great time, didn't we? These two incredibly powerful, smart women saved millions of lives by engendering the American public into joining the war effort. And it was such an important part of history. But it's just two women happy to see each other and saying, do you remember that time we went to Chicago? Shit. Ugh, oh, God damn it. I think it's really touching. Cheers. <laughs> Sorry. Don't talk. Oh, we gotta do it again. We talked. What? <laughs>